All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you could all be here today. I am especially excited because I get the honor of introducing Jeremy Smith, who is uh, the CTO of Medici Ventures, which is where I happen to work right now. And Jeremy is far and away the biggest agile proponent um, out of any CTO I've worked with in the past. Um, and so it's fantastic to be able to work for him. So super excited to have him here today. Um, don't forget to claim your educational units on scrumalliance.org. Um, make sure you stick around afterwards. We miss out on being able to see each other in person. Um, before everyone got on, we were talking about how wonderful it is when we can actually be together in person. Um, so we kind of miss out sometimes on the networking, but we will keep the um, Zoom open after. So if you want to stick around and do a little bit of networking, uh, feel free to do that. And then you can stay connected with us on utahagile.org. We have, um, I believe, three more events already scheduled and ready to go after this one. Um, and then we also have our Slack channel. If you are not on the Slack channel and you want to be on it, just um, send me or Steve a private message with your email address uh, and we'll get that invitation sent over to you. So anything else, Steve, did I miss anything? <laughs> no, I went really fast. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, with that, I will stop sharing and turn the time over to Jeremy. All right. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Utah Agile, for uh, inviting me to speak today. Yes, I'm a big Agile proponent. Uh, I love it, uh, breathe it, and talk about it frequently, especially at work, as Kelly knows. Um, yeah, just to add a little bit more to my background, I've been involved in uh, you know, IT and software since the mid-90s. Yes, it dates me a little bit. Um, got involved in a, a startup uh, where we provided data to insurance companies. And then uh, sold that to a private equity fund and then later to uh, a publicly traded company uh, in 2014. And uh, during that journey, going from the 90s, a small company as we grew to a more medium sized company, uh, you know, we had to adapt. And I learned about uh, Agile and Scrum. And in uh, gosh, mid 2010 area, somewhere around there, and uh, really uh, found value in it. And, you know, I, I'll admit, uh, implemented it poorly at the beginning, because uh, didn't really understand it, but then learned uh, along the journey. So, uh, you know, became a, a big convert. So, again, uh, thank you for having me and I'll uh, share my screen here. Let's see. How's that? Does that work? Yep. Okay, hold on. Actually, one second here. I am going to stop that. I need to swip, swap screens here. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, the title of this uh, presentation is, is one that I call uh, Agile Foundations. Um, you know, when I want to see uh, my family and friends' eyes glaze over, I start talking about Agile, to be honest with you. But I'll tell you, I know I'm amongst uh, agile and friends in this community who understand it. Uh, so thank you again for, for having me here. All right. So first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, give credit uh, to uh, the people who came beforehand. Um, so this quote from Sir Isaac Newton, he says, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, I say that because uh, you know, we all don't become who we are in a vacuum and all the things that we learn. And we learn from each other and learn from people who came before us. And uh, why am I having a hard time here? There we are. Uh, so here are some of the resources that I pulled from uh, for this presentation. You'll recognize maybe some of these books, others you may not. 
Uh, the DevOps Handbook is um, fantastic. Uh, Speed of Trust, uh, Accelerate, which is a companion to the DevOps Handbook. Uh, Sapiens, one of my favorite books. Uh, Management 3.0, and then of course the Manifesto Software Development and Agile Principles. Okay, so the purpose of software uh, engineering is to control complexity, not to create it. We know that developing software is, a, is hard and you have to manage a lot of complexities. Uh, sometimes people like to compare, you know, people who are not familiar with software development, compare it to maybe like a manufacturing facility. Oh, you just kind of like a car going through an assembly line. Well, that's a process where there's a lot of repetitive motion, right? Software is not necessarily, the actual outcome is not necessarily a, a product that is repeated, um, but the process can be. And so how do you manage all of these complexities? Uh, when changes come, uh, you know, late in, in the game, so to speak, um, how do you manage all of that? And that's, that's something the Agile addresses perfectly. So I think many organizations have experimented with Agile. And some will say, yes, Agile works. And others will say, you know, doing Agile didn't deliver the expected results. And so I want to provide uh, maybe some of my perspective on the difference of where we see Agile being successful and where Agile maybe not delivering what people were hoping for. So I don't know if you uh, have all experienced this. I know I have. Uh, you know, you see the commercial or you see the picture on the menu or on the board, and that's your expectation, right? And then you get the reality. Well, that gap between expectation of reality can sometimes be a wide gap, as we can see in this picture. And this gap, it creates stress, frustration, and disappointment. So what I hear, what I see happen is that someone will read an article in Forbes or uh, McKinsey and they'll say, oh, we've got to be agile. We've got to do this. And then they try to implement it. And then the reality isn't exactly what the article promised. So then they're like, well, I don't know if this works and it's a frustrating process. And so my argument is that, yes, there can be a gap and that gap is primarily around, um, you know, not, uh, not necessarily implementing it the right way. And, and I'll, I'll explain this. So one of my favorite, uh, uh, sayings that I, I say this many, many times is people over process and process over tools. And what that means is that you first have to start with people. Then you work on process and then the last is tool, the tools. And I've seen too many times, and I've made this mistake myself, where we have a problem and the first response is, well, let's just throw a tool at it. We just need a tool. And maybe that is the right answer that I'm not saying it's not, but many to my own experience that ended up not solving the problem I was hoping it to solve. The, the thinking goes, well, I just need a tool. Well, then you implement the tool and maybe the, whatever it is you're working on it is still broken. You're not developing software with higher quality or it's still going at a slow pace and it's challenging and difficult and frustration. So then, you know, people maybe visit the process, which is good, uh, visit the process and maybe that is it. But I want to also just focus on in, in this presentation around people and, and how important it is uh, the people are in the process. When you combine all of these together, people, process, and tools, starting with people, then process, then tools, you get more effective agile execution. I'm gonna, like I mentioned, I'm gonna start on people first. And when I say people, I mean all people in the organization. And this is one of the areas that I, I have seen uh, challenges where, uh, you know, like I mentioned, uh, uh, someone may read an article and say, oh, we have to do Agile. And it might be someone in a leadership position, for example. And they think it's just their teams need to do Agile. Well, to really have an effective transformation, it's everybody in the organization needs to be Agile. It's a change for the mindset. That's the most important thing is the mind needs to change for everybody in the organization for it to be the most effective. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on teams. So people that, you know, they work together and they have a team. And some of you may have seen this uh, before. It's called the Western Organizational Topology Model. And what he does, he was a, 
uh, a, a organizational psychologist, and he came up with these three different uh, uh, models that teams or organizations seem to fall into. So let's start with the first one. This is what he called pathological or power oriented. And in this, uh, uh, this model, uh, there's low cooperation, which means people are not sharing information. If you're a messenger and try to speak up, well, you're shot. Uh, responsibilities are shirked. That's not my job. I'm, I'm here to do this one thing. That's someone else's problem, not mine. Bridging, meaning working together with other teams or other people is discouraged. No, I need you to focus on the one thing that you're here to do and that's it. Failure leads to scapegoating. If something goes wrong, well, who are we going to kick out? And then novelty or uh, ideas are crushed. That's, there's no room for that. This is what I would call management 1.0. I think in earlier in the industrial revolution, this is certainly the way things operated. But then organizations, some hopefully, evolved into a more bureaucratic, um, which is more rule oriented. So there is some modest cooperation. People, some people are sharing information. Messengers, okay, we're not gonna shoot you, but you know, we won't listen to you. Responsibilities are narrow, but you know, people will take on more. Bridging is tolerated. Yeah, it's okay to talk to you know, the other department over there. Failure leads to justice and punishment. And novelty need, leads to problems. You know, yeah, that's a good idea, but that's just gonna make everything difficult. Yeah, it could work, but it's just gonna be hard and it just dies off. I would call this management 2.0. We still see a lot of this today, uh, more bureaucratic focused organizations. Where I think Agile actually does best is in generative high performance oriented organizations. So first there's high cooperation. What that means is that information is flowing throughout the organization. Messengers are trained and welcomed. If there's a problem, please speak up because we want to improve our idea that you know, our, our mindset is that we want to always be improving and doing better. So if there's a problem, we want to know about it because we want to fix it and do better. Risks are shared, meaning that if someone takes a risk, it's okay. It's okay to take the risk. People can you know, have failure and it's okay to learn from those mistakes. Bridging is encouraged. Yes, talk to other people. Don't let, you know, uh, bureaucracy get in the way from working with someone else to come up with a solution. Failure leads to inquiry. How do we improve? We know this through, you know, retrospectives, for example. And novelty is implemented. That's a great idea. Yes, we should definitely be doing that. This is what I would call management 3.0. And this is the kind of organization that is more ripe and prime for Agile. It's really adopting Agile already. And this is the kind of environment that uh, seems to be the most productive and the most effective. So what makes these three teams different? Where one team can collaborate and build a complex vision together, while other teams continually struggle? Well, there can be several factors, but we're going to focus on one thing, a force that's complex, essential, and invisible. And that is trust. Trust. This is so important within an organization. This is why I call this Agile Foundations. It is the foundation for good Agile is built on top of trust. And I'll demonstrate that trust, when it exists within individuals, within teams, and within, within the organization, that the overall effectiveness of that organization is much higher. And then I'll tie trust into Agile and the Agile principles. So let's start with a quote. So trust is the reciprocal exchange of information with others over time. Again, reciprocal information going like this. When there is trust, information moves circuitously and speedily. When there is betrayal of trust, then information abruptly stops. This is really, really important because the most important thing in developing software is the flow of information. How is information flowing throughout the team, between team members, 
and throughout the organization. When there is friction in that process, everything slows down. So trust is the lubricant to allow information to flow. So trust greatly increases the flow of information, as I stated, by reducing friction. Then flowing information allows for fast feedback loops. We know that this is so important with software development, that we need fast feedback loops of information for, to, for us to understand, how do I need to adjust? What do I need to do differently? Customer wants this, how do we get that information? into the team so that we can build what they want. And how do we get that back, that information back to the customer to verify, is this what you want? Yes or no, actually I wanna change that. That flow of information has to be fast. We, and DevOps uh, talks a lot about this. The DevOps handbook talks a lot about this. Fast feedback loops allows for faster iterations. The faster you can iterate leads to a better market fit of the product and a better market fit leads to a more successful company. So tying this all together, trust increases the flow of information. The flow of information leads to fast feedback loops. Fast feedback loops lead to fast iterations. Fast iterations lead to better market fit. Better market fit leads to a more successful company. But it all starts with trust. That's the most important thing. So what is trust? What is that? How does that look? Trust means confidence. The opposite of trust is distrust, and that is suspicion. The difference between high and low trust relationships is dramatic. So with high trust, this is one of the, I have these litmus tests that I use to understand and judge for myself whether I'm, I'm engaging in a trust relationship with someone or within a team or an organization. One of these is that with high trust, you can say the wrong thing and people will still get what you mean. And you can work together to still get things done quickly. With low trust, you can be very measured in your language, very precise, and you will still be misinterpreted. It can take a disproportionate amount of time and energy to reach an agreement. One of the examples I use on this, that again, litmus test, is writing an email. So if I'm writing an email to somebody, and I'm thinking through and being very careful and like, okay, I have to be very measured in my words, I have to articulate. What I'm, what I'm learning is that, okay, the situation here, I need to make sure, I need to work on trust with this individual so that we can trust each other. That's, that's it, but if it's another individual, I can type out an email, get it out, and I know that the intention will be understood. I don't have to put so much energy into making sure that every word is precise. That, that's how I kind of just judge whether I'm operating in a trust um, kind of, uh, you know, relationship with somebody. This is a quote from uh, uh, Chris Willis. He was Domo's chief of design. And he says, trust eats strategy, technology, roles, and incentives for breakfast. Agreed, 100, 100%. So what does a trust look like within an actual team? So the way uh, we can look at this is that when you're operating in a low test trust environment, you're, you're accumulating a tax, you're taking on a tax, where if you're working in a high trust environment, you get dividends. So what are some low trust taxes? Well, there's the redundancy tax. Things have to be looked over and checked over and over and over again. There's a lot of redundancy. That's caught, that, that's a tax. Unnecessary bureaucracy is a tax. Toxic politics, tax, everything slows down. Disengagement, people are not engaged in what you're doing. There's a tax associated with that. Turnover, people leaving an organization, having a lot of turnover due to low trust, that's a tax that, that, that slows everything down. Fraud, potentially, tax. Well, let's look at high trust dividends. Increased value in what you're producing, bonus. Accelerated growth, that's a dividend. Enhanced innovation, new ideas, how can we do this better? How about this idea, dividend. Improved collaboration, let's work together, let's communicate, 
Let's have that flow of information happen quickly. Strong partnering with people and individuals to get things done. We can't do it alone. Better execution. What we're building is what the customer wants. Heightened loyalty. I love working here. These are, this is my team. I love this organization. It's low turnover. So trust is the social glue that differentiates great collaborating teams from others. So the goal is to establish a high trust team culture. Going back to that slide I showed earlier, it begins with trust to increase the flow of information, which can lead to a more successful company. So how do we increase trust? And there's a lot of literature on trust. So I will point out, this is, I mentioned Speed of Trust, great book to read, I highly recommend it. Um, there's a lot of different takes on trust. It's not a simple thing to actually put your finger on. It's one of those things you can feel a lot of times. Um, one of those things that you can't always describe in words, but you know it when you see it and you can feel it. Um, so there's a lot of literature around this. So my, what I'm presenting here is, is just some ideas. So Covey uh, here, and this is Stephen M. R. Covey, he says, we judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their behavior. This is why one of the fastest ways to restore trust is to make and keep commitments, even very small commitments to ourselves and to others. That very first sentence, he's touching upon something that is really, really important. It's called the fundamental attribution error. And we all have it. And what the fundamental attribution error is, is that when something goes well for ourselves, then we tend to think, we tend to credit internal reasons as to why it went well. I'm so smart, I work hard, you know, I did this, I did that. That's why the good thing happened. When a bad thing happens to us, we tend to say, well, it was that reason over there, this person did that, it was all external reasons. And we do the opposite for other people. Again, this is a, a bias we tend to have, an error that all of us tend to make. We do the opposite with other people. When something good happens, we tend to credit external reasons why. Well, they just got lucky, they were the right place at the right time. External things are what caused it. When bad things happen though, we tend to interpret it, well, they, did a, they made a bad choice. It's an internal reason why something bad happened to them. But when something bad happens to us, it's external. But when something bad happens to others, well, it's because they, you know, it's their own fault, right? And so we, we tend to minimize the external factors as well. And so that's an important bias that we tend to do when you're looking at a situation, both within ourselves and with others. So trust is a combination of character that's internal and competence, it's the things that we do. So character includes your integrity, motive, and intent with people. It's based on the principles that you follow in your life. It's constant and necessary for trust in any circumstance. Character is constant. It's internal to you and it's, it's who you are, it's your character. Also, you combine that with your external things that people see and that people can understand what you're doing, which includes your capabilities, your skills, results, track record, Competence is situational, depends on where the circumstance, on what the circumstance requires. And it's external, it's your actions. So then moving down the triangle, uh, I'll talk a little bit about process. This is where Agile does a great job. Trust is the foundation for the manifesto of Agile software development. So let's do a quick review of that. And I want you to put, put your mind into framing, thinking about this in, in trust. Like how does trust influence this? Or what does trust mean in the, in the manifesto? We are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others to do it. 
Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over process and tools. Process and tools are important, but again, people, individuals, how do we interact? Are we sharing information together? When we're in stand up, do people just kind of, well, I'm doing this and this and this, or are they actually sharing valuable information that others need to hear that we can talk about and collaborate on? Working software over comprehensive documentation. Documentation is good, right? But the primary measure is, is it working? Software actually working? Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. There is no substitute for working close with a customer, collaborating with them, sharing the information, getting the information back and forth, moving that quickly. Responding to change over following a plan. This goes back to the management 3.0, the generative uh, organization. Are people adaptive? Can they change? Can they change when something happens? Can we change our process? Can we change how we work? Can I share that information and trust that person to say, hey, this was a mistake. Let's talk about it and how, we can, how can we all improve so we all can learn and move forward. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So the Agile Manifesto aims to build trust by teaching principles, not micromanage the process, not micromanaging the process. So let's, again, I'm gonna present all the principles. You're all familiar with them, you know what they are, but I'm just gonna present them. I'm not gonna read them out loud. I'll present them one by one, and I just want you to think about it in the, in the framework of trust. How does this look within a trusting environment versus a non-trusting? I will put a caveat in this because when it was written, it was weeks and months. In today's modern world, hours and days is, is becoming uh, more of the standard. So, in summary, failing to address trust on an agile team is a common problem. Without trust, everything, and I put that in all caps, everything slows down and agile fails to deliver on its promise. There is no substitution for trust. Agile, and I'm a big proponent, but it cannot overcome low trust. 
trust has to exist for it to succeed. And this is the difference that we see in successful agile implementations and ones that are not as successful. I can't tell you on every single one, but I can tell you if you don't have trust, it's not going to work. It's going to have, you're going to have problems. And so the key is to build trust because start there. That's the foundation. Everything has to be built across the organization um, on trust in order for agile to really be successful. And that's it. Thank you. And totally open for, uh, for questions. Yeah, so I just, I'll start the questions off. Sometimes it's good to have someone start, get people thinking about what they want to ask. Um, so I just, you know, as a longtime scrum master and working in various companies, um, there's oftentimes this feeling of pushing from the middle, right? And we're doing our best and we're you know, scrum masters and product owners and whatever that middle layer is, we're doing our best, but sometimes it's hard to either get buy-in from above or below. Usually it's getting the buy-in from above. And so how can we, you know, when we're in this position in the middle, how can we get those relationships of trust established? Like, do you have any good advice for getting that started? Yeah, and, and I, I wish there was one simple answer and I wish that it was easier than what it is. Um, you know, I think I can tell you, Medici, what, what happened there is that um, there are individuals within the organization who really understood Agile and how important it was. And it took time and convincing the hardest part of, of leadership to eventually adopt. And this is before I, before I arrived. Um, when I arrived, there was already um, an attitude that Agile was, was, was a positive um, way to go. Um, it took, like I mentioned, it took time and a lot of effort, um, a lot of debate. Uh, and that's not easy. Uh, that, takes, that takes patience. It takes openness and understanding. Um, it takes someone willing to give it a chance and to hear the different perspectives. So what I would say is, you know, have the arguments, and you know your organization best, but have the arguments ready and prepared to give as far as why Agile will be beneficial. I think people all hear it and see it as maybe a buzzword and they don't necessarily understand how it actually looks. Um, and really being able to articulate that, explain it um, to, to the people that you need to, to get adoption. The hard part is, and this is tough, is that it requires everybody to change a mindset um, as well because for leadership to accept it, one of the principles there is uh, uh, self-organizing teams. Well, for some leadership, that's really hard to cross that because they may want to have a more direct control of exactly all the decisions being made on a team. Whereas Agile is saying, hey, look, you know, tell us where the ship is going, where we, what's the vision, where are we taking it? And we can figure out the logistics exactly how to do that. And for some leadership, that's, that's hard. And so it, it does take um, sometimes them being willing to take the risk and, and it's on you know, others and scrum masters as an example to help them make that, cross that bridge to say, yes, it's, you know, I understand it may feel risky, but you know, this is something that can work. But in order for it to work, the team needs to be ready as well. The team needs to be prepared because if there are promises that are made to leadership, but the team is not ready and they're not prepared and they're not quite understanding, then it's just going to, you know, damage things in the long run. And, you know, that, that, uh, that's just not helpful. All right. Anyone else? You can put them in chat. You can just unmute yourself and ask your question. I can wait. <laughs> I love this quote here. It says, uh, John Warfin said that character is what you are in the dark. I like that. That's good. Yeah, I will say for me personally, um, I got into being a Scrum Master from prior being a software QA. And that was one of the big things for me was realizing like there is so much benefit in actually living the values, even outside of work, right? Like, it just becomes 
part of who you are. It doesn't have to be something that you just put on as you go into the office. It's like, no, the, these agile values are part of who I am day to day. And it really helps to just change your mindset that way. So, okay. Um, yes, yeah, so we will share the slides um, and the presentation is recorded. So I'll share that as well. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, we can move into networking. Jeremy, thank you again so much. I know you're busy, so if you need to drop off, I certainly understand that, but we'll stop recording right now. Quick before you do that, I, I have a question. I'm just not sure how to phrase it. Okay. Um, so I might pivot my question as I speak. Um, how or do you have any advice on identifying where the lack of trust is in the organization? Mm. So for example, I'm a product manager in my current role. Um, and I, I also am the product owner for a specific dev team. And our scrum master also doubles as a program manager. And so we have a lot of doubled roles. And so sometimes I feel like our team is doing really well and communication is really great. And sometimes I feel like it's breaking down everywhere. And I'm not sure if it's because of the role doubling or if it's because of a lack of trust. And, and I'm trying to think through right now as we have this, this meeting, am I the one that's causing the breakdown of trust? And if I am, how do I identify that? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I do. Um, first, doubling up on roles is difficult. Um, that's, that's a challenge, uh, especially a, a scrum master. I, I do uh, really side on a dedicated scrum master. Um, I, I nickname scrum masters as the steward of the process. And if you look at the second law of thermodynamics, which is entropy, uh, that process also ex experiences entropy if you don't have a steward to watch over it and protect it to make sure the process doesn't break down. Because if it's left unattended without a steward, it begins to degrade and things start getting overlooked and all of that. And that's why I feel it's so important um, to have a dedicated scrum master. So I did want to say that because they can put all their attention on being that steward of the process. Uh, with regards to sometimes you feel that uh, information is moving well and other times it seems like it's breaking down. Uh, the question I actually would uh, put back towards you and this was this uh, Aaron, is that right? Yes. Okay, Aaron. Um, the question I would pose back is, you know, is your team uh, reflecting and adapting? Are you having the conversations when you see communication or information slow down? Are you addressing that explicitly? Um, do you feel, do you or your team feel comfortable even talking about those breakdowns and is that happening? And if so, are you making the necessary adjustments to, um, to try to address that, to understand how and why it's happening? And, you know, that's, that's can sometimes can be difficult, um, you know, because having open, honest conversations with teams uh, can be hard. That would be the first thing I would, I would say. Um, second is how do you understand where things are breaking down within the organization or where trust exists and where it doesn't? Uh, like I mentioned, uh, I, there, personally, uh, I have these kind of litmus tests uh, that I use when I'm dealing or, or conversing with someone or working with someone. Um, I try to, uh, you know, understand, you know, am I, being extra careful in words I'm saying, am I being very measured in how I'm responding, uh, and try to get a sense of whether a trust exists there. Now that's on my own, that's personal relationships. When it's trust within parts of an organization that you don't have a lot of connection to, uh, that's a little more difficult and challenging. I'm not sure if I know a great answer for that to understand where or how uh, trust is breaking down. Those are great thoughts, thank you. Welcome. Uh, just as a, a quick follow up, I feel like, at least for us, I, I am very system oriented and loud. 
and some of my team is not very system oriented and quiet. And so we, we bring up the topic a lot. Like if, if something's going wrong or there's, you know, some question inefficiency, whatever it is, we bring it up, but then I don't, I hear myself talking and I don't hear my team talking, even though I'm specifically allowing time for people to think and respond. I, like I, I personally feel like I'm allowing the team to give input and not just rambling, but I still don't get input back from the team. They don't, they don't offer up their opinion. They don't say if they agree or disagree. It feels like they just, they say yes, sir, and they move on. Right. You might want to try a one-on-one -on -one perspective at that point. Um, I'm the same way. I'm more loud than some of my team members. And it just might be that they don't want to talk in a group setting. So, you know, maybe try and identify the person that could be the champion of the change you're hoping to see and focus in on that person and try and get them on board. And then usually um, if they're kind of the person that everyone tends to follow, then you'll probably get people to start opening up more, I would say. Yeah, that's a good thought, thank you. Uh, can I throw in one more question? Yeah. Hey, Jeremy, thanks, thanks a ton for this. I, uh, I'm on the side of selling the tools. <laughs> so I get the chance to talk to a lot of different teams from time to time, obviously, about, about this. And I want it to be successful on their side. Uh, you, you brought out some of the, the points that I, that I've been curious why things weren't working. And now that I see it, I'm curious what kind of maybe advice you have in regards to how companies, um, executives can go about this type of cultural change. Uh, so they build this kind of trust. You know, what, what might be something I can point them towards or something they could start investigating so that they can get this vision of what they need to do for people, you know, over processes. Absolutely. Um, I mentioned right at the very beginning, speed of trust. Uh, that lays a, a great foundation on trust, on understanding it, on recognizing it when it's there, recognizing it when it's not. Um, that first is, is a wealth of knowledge, and, and I wish I could pack all of that into this presentation, but I highly recommend that. The second thing I would say is that, you know, at Medici Ventures, you know, we have a, you know, I know it may sound cliche, but we have a mission statement and core values, but it's not just a, you know, we have a big piece of paper on the wall that has it, but it's not just a piece of paper. It's something we frequently talk about. We bring it up at every standup. We focus on one of the core values. We talk about them. We have a value our values program where people, if they recognize one of their colleagues exhibiting one of the core values that we believe in, then they can anonymously submit their name and the person gets a hundred dollars. Um, you know, we have these things in place to acknowledge and recognize when our values are being followed. And we talk about trust. This isn't a thing that like we, you know, we don't talk about, we talk about trust. We, you know, meetings that I run with, with my management team, we explicitly, explicitly will even talk about, did, you know, are we operating in high trust or low trust? Oh, when I did that, did I break some trust there? How can we rectify that? Like it's a topic of conversation. And when you get everybody on the same page talking about it and seeing that framework of like, okay, we always want to maintain and build trust. And if we're doing something that is not leading, you know, that's not living the core value, that's breaking down trust within your organization, right? People see that. They're looking at leadership and how they're behaving. And if they're not following the core values, that starts to break down trust. And so, you know, it's holding everybody across the organization to those standards. And so, you know, those are some of the things that we do. We talk about it. We bring visibility to things. You know, we talk about trust, but you know, right at the beginning, though, like I said, I would recommend reading Speed of Trust. It's a fantastic book to kind of book to start that kind of uh, conversation and, and uh, you know, view and perspective on trust. Awesome. Thank you. It's been on the list. I'll have to bounce it to the top. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah. One other one that I loved was uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Yeah, yeah I haven't read that one. Type of topics, too. Was, but I think uh, Stephen or, you know, Amar Covey will go deeper. It'll be great. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. And I also noticed someone recommended the Fearless Organization, which I've heard of, but have not read yet. Um, so, and then also uh, Google, uh, they mentioned, uh, Eliza here mentioned psychological safety. Um, 
if you go to rework, uh, I think it's rework.google, but just Google rework, R-E work. Um, Google, they have, you know, they have a team, they try to analyze how teams operate and what constitutes high performing teams versus low performing teams. And they publish all their findings there. And they have a whole framework around psychological safety and what that leads to. That's another reference that is really, really helpful that, you know, read the articles and go through it and just, you know, build your own personal understanding, start sharing with others in your organization as well. Um, it's great. So Jeremy, did you see the question about uh, how can we make sure developers trust each other better in delivering in an expected pace to respect the product owner vision? Do you have an example of how we can make sure developers trust each other? Yeah, so um, that's, that's, a that's a tough one. That's right, personal relationships within a team. Um, I think first, to build trust, I talked about competency, right? Being consistent as well. Um, you know, to build trust, you have to demonstrate, hey, you know, this is what, these are my capabilities and I can do these things consistently. Um, that helps build trust that people think, oh, I can rely on this person. Um, I think being honest uh, as well, you know, if, uh, and this starts again, you have to have trust to have these kinds of conversations that if you're in a retrospective, for example, and there was an inconsistent uh, delivery and it, you know, the team needs to be in a, a place where they're psychologically safe, where there's trust, where they can have those conversations about why did we slow down? Well, usually there's a reason. I mean, you know, it could be, you know, that we ran into issues that we weren't anticipating, some unplanned work that occurred. Uh, it could be that, you know, someone was sick. It could be uh, that someone wasn't really super motivated during that last sprint, for example. Um, you know, and providing a space where there can be discussion about, hey, how can we help you succeed, for example? Um, you know, but also be, recognize that teams, I think it's, it's, it's challenging for any team, even teams that are well, have a trust and, and, and have worked together for a while, it's still hard for them to maintain a constant pace. Um, it still is challenging. I mean, Kelly knows this. She works on teams um, that are fantastic, fantastic. I mean, they're very good. And even still on those teams, it's still hard. Things happen. And uh, I think it's something we always try to work towards, but also need to understand and recognize there can be circumstances that make it difficult. All right, any other questions? Mm. I like Cliff's comment here. I think it's important to make your values known to the team. At, I think that's great. Yeah, and you know, I, I so retrospectives, I, I, um, I'm a big fan of, right? It gives us a chance to inspect and adapt, right? Uh, but also to get, it gets the team time to get to know each other. And the conversations like what you value. Some retrospectives that I, cause I, I, I've been a scrum master. I, I loved it. Um, after I left the, after we sold the company, kind of figuring out, well, what do we want to do? And I love being a scrum master. And I became a scrum master and loved it, dive deep. And, and I love working hands-on with teams. And, you know, some retrospectives were focused on, uh, you know, things like just exercises, get to know each other. Um, we, you know, there's one uh, that I would do about, uh, you know, who, who are the top three people you admire, men and women? and list out and tell us why. I'll tell you what, you get people to open up about their moms or about relationships that they have, you get to know people. And when the team starts to get to know people and hear you know, people's backgrounds, experiences, I think that helps um, you know, increase trust and build relationships, which are really important for a team. Yeah, 